you all for listening, and I look forward to a wonderful year moving forward. Thanks. Thanks, Laurie, and UBCM is in great hands, folks. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Peter Exotta, Vice President Planning and Operations of the Vancouver Fraser Port uh, Authority. The Port of Vancouver has contributed a $5,000 gift certificate uh, from Expedia for one lucky delegate. You must be in the room? No, I can't say that. Uh, please join me in welcoming Peter to the stage. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for having the Port of Vancouver uh, included in your uh, agenda today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging I'm speaking to you today from the ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and to extend my thanks to them. It's now time to select a winner of the Port of Vancouver Cruise uh, Prize draw. As was indicated, the winner will receive a $5,000 Expedia gift certificate towards a Vancouver to Alaska cruise uh, with no expiry date. At the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, we're offering this prize on behalf of everyone at the Port of Vancouver uh, in recognition of the cruise industry, a critically important part of our tourism sector in Vancouver and indeed throughout the province. We're all looking forward to welcoming cruise passengers back to Vancouver as soon as the health protocols and context permits. Before our prize draw, I'd like to make a couple of comments about the work of the Port Authority. Uh, and how it connects with everyone joining us today from local governments around British Columbia. And I'll show you a quick video clip. The key message I'd like to deliver is uh, that the Port Authority is working on win-win projects with local governments around the region, and we're working to protect the environment while enabling Canada's all-important trade uh, for our underlying economy for all Canadians. So the Port Authority is a federal agency tasked with enabling Canada's trade through the Port of Vancouver. That growth even uh, through the pandemic, continues. Canadians want access to international goods, the things that you buy at your local retailers throughout the province. And because the world is clamoring for Canadian uh, grain and other resource products uh, that drive the Canadian economy, uh, we continue to grow and expand our facilities. Under our mandate, we enable trade while considering local communities and protecting the environment. To give you an example of what that looks like on the community front, we're working closely with local governments and communities in the region on building overpasses and underpasses to uh, reduce the impact of goods movement on commuters and, as I said, the environment. These projects separate road and rail networks, which adds trade capacity that's important. Uh, and then we work with municipalities and communities to tailor these projects to deliver priority local benefits. To give you an example of what this looks like, we have a fairly advanced project right now with CN and the city of Burnaby that includes a new overpass over rail lines at Hold'em Avenue in Burnaby. This project supports trade by adding important rail capacity to serve North Shore terminals. At the same time, at the local level, the project will support the city of Burnaby's transportation plans and provide more efficient route for vehicles and pedestrians who might otherwise have gotten stuck behind uh, rail crossing. Uh, the project increases safety and it creates opportunities for public space and active transportation, uh, which can include things like bike lanes and pedestrian walkways. And if you're familiar with this area, uh, those improvements will be uh, dramatically uh, improving the situation for pedestrians and bicycles because of, uh, uh, of the park and trail network in, in the city of Burnaby, which I happen to live in. So it's a great example of win-win projects for trade and the local community. Turning briefly to environmental protection, we lead and collaborate on a suite of environmental programs to ensure that Canada's trade can grow within the context of strong environmental protection. Our work includes important collaborations with the BC government, such as our aligned effort to advance LNG bunkering in the port, and our partnership together with TransLink on the Clean Trucking Initiative. One program we're really proud of is the world-leading ECHO program, which, which we lead in collaboration with industry, government and indigenous groups. The ECHO program seeks to quantifiably reduce the cumulative impacts of commercial shipping on at-risk whales with a, with a particular focus on reducing underwater noise. I'll show, you a, a, I'll show you a video clip about that momentarily. To pull this together, what I hope you'll take away is the Port Authority is working on win-win projects with local governments. We're working to protect the environment all the while, of course, focusing on uh, enabling trade for Canada, Canadians, and of course, British Columbians. Now for the Echo video, and then we'll draw that uh, important uh, Lucky Cruise Prize winner's name. 
We share the beautiful coast with whales that rely on echolocation to survive. So we're proud that over 6,000 ships have helped cut underwater sound intensity nearly in half. By voluntarily slowing down and staying distant as part of the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority-led echo program. Creating quieter oceans for healthier whales. This program has been a, a substantial uh, collaboration with the entire shipping industry. We're pleased to say that uh, participation in that program has been in the in the 90 percent of all vessel operators uh, operating in the port. So really pleased with our ability to do that. Now I'm going to turn my attention to pulling that name and uh, and announcing the lucky winner. Okay, we have a person I'm actually familiar with, a Mr. Peter Luckham, the Chair of Islands Trust. Peter, we're happy and pleased to be able to offer you that cruise. So I want to just say on behalf of the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority to the UBCM members and the organization, thanks again for having the Port of Vancouver here. And I would just echo the incoming president's uh, note uh, about being patient as we work through uh, all of the challenges we've had. I'm sure we're going to come out of this stronger uh, for it. So thank you very much and have a great conference. Thanks again to the uh, Port of Vancouver and Peter uh, for sponsoring the delegate prize draw today. The Premier's address is the next session in your live program. Click, please click it on it now on your left-hand part of your menu and we will be back momentarily. Thank you. It gives, gives me great pleasure to introduce BC's Premier and leader of the NDP, John Horgan. 
John was elected MLA for the new riding of Langford, Juan de Fuca in 2017. He was first elected to the legislature in 2005 as MLA for Juan de Fuca and has been re-elected three times. He became leader of the BC NDP in 2014. Convention delegates, we are switching up the format for the Premier's address this year. The Premier will provide opening remarks and then has agreed to take questions from you, the delegates. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming John Horgan. Good morning. Premier John Horgan here, and I'm coming to you today from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. At the outset, of course, I want to thank Brian Franco, the UBCM executive, and the organizers of this week's convention for the opportunity to speak to you at this extraordinary time. I want to acknowledge the decision that voters in British Columbia made last year to send a new generation of MLAs to the legislature. As you know, Josie Osborne was the mayor of Tofino. She is a hardworking and conscientious advocate who always brings a collaborative spirit to the table. Pam Alexis was the mayor of Mission, and Sheila Malcolmson served as the chair of the Islands Trust for six years. Another 16 members of my government have served as municipal councillors or regional directors, and five more have served as school board trustees and two as Vancouver Park Board Commissioners. That's a lot of local, on-the-ground experience. I'm so proud and happy that they bring youth, diversity, and a fresh perspective to government. Now, as you also all know, oftentimes it's easy to push tough decisions off into the future. But that's why I'm committing to tackle those tough problems as they arise. We pledged ourselves to improving the environment and tackling climate change, to building a fairer, more resilient economy, to repairing a forestry industry that for too long has benefited too few, and to providing more affordable childcare and housing for young families right across BC. We also need to engage, of course, in true and meaningful reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. All of these complex issues have come together in the midst of a global pandemic. 2020 was one of the most challenging years of our lifetime. And the difference between this year and last year is that science has given us a vaccine, our best defense against COVID-19. Our goal all along has been to keep British Columbians safe and healthy. We knew we had to protect our healthcare system and keep our economy rolling. So we launched the largest vaccination program in the province's history. The tireless efforts of Dr. Bonnie Henry and Minister Adrian Dix have helped us to get to this hopeful stage with almost 78% of eligible British Columbians being fully vaccinated and fully 4 million of our citizens have received at least one dose of a vaccine. An extraordinary achievement by any measure. But now is not the time to ease up. Your actions help encourage residents in your community to get vaccinated. I encourage all of you to make sure that you're spreading the word so that we can stop the spread of COVID-19. We've all come through another difficult summer with wildfires turning day into night and night into day, reducing to ash what took generations to grow. Those losses have been some of the worst we've seen in recent memory. And we owe many thanks to British Columbians like healthcare workers who have been on the front lines of a dual health crisis, not just COVID, but the opioid epidemic as well. First responders have answered the call as well, night or day, to make sure people are safe. And to the crews and volunteers who have been on the front lines of the fires, I give you my unbettered gratitude and thanks for the work that you did to protect people you may never meet. I've been to Lillooet and Logan Lake, Vernon, Castlegar and Kamloops, and I met the brave people fighting wildfires this summer. Their determination in the face of adversity is a model for all of us. And I know many of you have had sleepless nights as well. You've worked tirelessly to keep your community safe through the wildfires, the floods, the heat waves, the pandemic, the opioid crisis, all of these events coming to play at your time as leaders in your community. Local action, provincial action, national action is what we need to address all of these issues. And I'm confident working together, we can do that. I want to thank you all for what you do for your families, your neighbours and your communities. We're all so grateful that the support of British Columbians has helped us get through this critical time so that we can work together 
to make sure that we're all safe. And it's at times like this that we see extraordinary events take place right before our eyes. Even though they were grieving, the Tekemlips and Shoepmat people opened up their powwow grounds as a muster station for families and neighbors to reconnect. And in Chilliwack, a young girl was saddened when she heard a village had been burned down. What did she do? She raised more than $3,000 for Lytton by selling lemonade, one $2 cup at a time. Now that's a lot of lemons, but it's also a wonderful expression of the British Columbia spirit. Despite these challenges, we've continued to focus on keeping our economy growing while protecting the environment and preparing for a climate that is changing how we look at everything in our lives. Minister Ravi Kalan has spent this year meeting with stakeholders, including many of you, to devise the best possible post-pandemic economic recovery we can put together. Next month, our government will release British Columbia's strategy for long-term economic growth. And Minister George Heyman will also be releasing an update on our climate plan, a plan that has shown how we intend to meet our 2030 climate targets and get to net zero by 2050. Climate change is a reality facing communities wherever you live. Our Clean BC plan makes a $2.2 billion investment for cleaner transportation, more energy efficient buildings, and lower industrial emissions. Made in BC technologies offer a glimpse into a brighter, better future. Exciting advances in carbon capture and in converting organic waste into clean sources of energy. Right here in BC, right now with much more coming as our innovators get the opportunity to bring forward the solutions to these extraordinary problems. And now you understand the urgency of this. You sometimes better than anyone. You know how critical it is to have flexible, predictable funding to advance your climate action goals. And we've heard your feedback. Over the coming months, George Heyman, in partnership with Josie Osborne, will establish a new program to support your local government actions, and we look forward to collaborating with you to make this program a success. And as we grow the economy, we'll be addressing these big challenges, the biggest challenges of our age, challenges that seem daunting, but they need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed together. North, south, east, west, wherever we come from in this great province, the only way forward is to go forward together. During the pandemic, we provided supports for people and businesses to help weather the storm. We also have been working closely with you to make sure communities bounce back as well. And we'll continue to do that by working together. We secured the province's share of federal funding so that we could have a safe restart here in BC. That's $810 million to help local governments serve people. We ensured ferries and transit continue to operate. We funded inner city bus operators and 55 regional airports to guarantee British Columbians, especially those in rural communities, could stay connected. We expanded community broadband and cellular service along isolated highways. And now 200 rural and indigenous communities have the reliable high-speed internet they need to connect to the world. Every penny invested has made it possible for our economy to rebound. And we've had an eye on the future as well and new technologies. And that's why we've created a half billion dollar strategic investment fund called NBC. It will help promising tech sector companies grow and attract world-class talent. And we'll continue to invest in the hard hit arts and tourism sectors that so many of your communities depend on. And we want everyone who comes to BC to not only return, but to tell their friends and families to come as well. And that's why we're extending the successful funding for destination development. Another $20 million will be available for First Nations and local governments and not-for-profits to invest in tourism infrastructure. This will create local jobs by improving the visitor experience and extending the tourism season. A strong economy is what allows us to build a fairer, more equitable society. The pandemic has shown us that when we come together, we can confront the toughest challenges imaginable. And giving people hope and confidence for a brighter future is what we all need to be about. Forests are at the heart of our identity as British Columbians, and we must sustain them for people, for wildlife, and for the economy. We are at a turning point, and it's time to correct the failed policies of the past. To do so, we need a balanced approach. Our forest intentions paper outlines how we'll restore public control over a public resource 
for public benefit. Local communities and First Nations will have a greater say in the managing of forests in their backyards and on their traditional territory. And we'll pass legislation this fall protecting communities as we make this transition. Our bounty of natural resources must benefit all British Columbians. This will boost forest sustainability while ensuring more logs are available for local jobs. And it will support the technological advancements that the industry is doing as our future depends on making sure we innovate. I want to congratulate New Westminster on becoming the latest in a growing list of municipalities to allow the construction of mass timber buildings up to 12 stories. Mass timber adds more value to forest products and creates better jobs. We all know everyone needs a safe and affordable place to call home. Encampments work for no one, least of all the unhoused. Sustainable housing is the best way to break the disheartening cycle of homelessness. Housing is the number one issue for people right across BC. Rural communities need housing for workers. And through our Homes for BC plan, we're investing $7 billion over a decade to improve housing supply and affordability. And we're providing an additional $2 billion in development financing for new homes. No matter where you live, you need safe, reliable transportation. So when Northern communities lost inner city commercial bus service, we created BC Bus North, a service to provide safe, reliable, and affordable options for residents in Northern BC. From Prince Rupert to Prince George, from Port Nelson to Bailmount, all points in between, it is a lifeline keeping communities connected. And to do this and more, we have created the largest capital budget in BC history to keep people and the economy on the move. We'll be building a toll-free eight-lane replacement for the Massey Tunnel. Whatever happens on Monday, I'm confident we will have a partner in Ottawa to help with the cost. The new tunnel will ease a daily bottleneck that frustrates commuters and it will ensure that trade can continue to flow to the port. Improvements to Highway 1 will reduce congestion in the Fraser Valley from Vancouver to Abbotsford and beyond. And we're also making major improvements to Highway 1 from Kamloops to the Alberta border. The fast-growing communities of Surrey and Langley will be serviced by an extension of SkyTrain. All of these improvements and other improvements are still to come. And I'm pleased to announce today that 59 Indigenous and local governments will be building new active transportation infrastructure. We're investing 13.2 million in new pathways for a safer, healthier, greener future. This will benefit people in every corner of the province, creating jobs and connecting communities. British Columbia has the economic foundation for a strong recovery. And I'm looking forward to once again traveling our great province, to marvel at its natural wonders and to meet people who make this the most interesting place on the planet. We all need to continue to work together to find common ground to solve problems, to build a better, stronger, more resilient British Columbia for everyone. We will rebuild Lytton better than before. A village rich in history will become a model for communities in an age of climate change. And we are also up to those challenges, provided we stay together. And this is so important. We all got into this for public service, to contribute to making the world a little bit better than it was when we came along. And we'll do that, not out of self-interest, but in the best interest of our children and grandchildren. Our shared responsibility is to continue to work together to build a better, safer, fairer British Columbia. Thank you once again for all you do for our people and our communities. Premier Horgan, thank you for those introductory remarks. Uh, before we begin to take questions from the delegates, I would like to remind delegates of the process for posing your question. <clears throat> you can submit questions for the Premier in the Engage tab. Please note UBCM moderators review each question and release them to the session chair two at a time. We are receiving a large volume of questions in all of our sessions this week. There may be a delay be between you submitting a question and it's asked or potentially asked. Um, please remember to sign your questions with your designation, your community, and who you are. So thank you for your patience. I've seen the chat. Please be patient. And if you don't get any of the questions answered, you can 
call me and I will do my best to get those done. So, so to kick things off, I'd like to begin by posing a couple of questions to the Premier on behalf of UBCM. Premier, you know that we've, uh, uh, the st uh, Strong Fiscal Future report back in 2013 really didn't gain a lot of traction at the time. It was a great report. It was comprehensive. In 2020, uh, the beginning of this year, we reconstituted a committee to look at local government finance and local government resiliency. So out of that, a great group of people from large uh, rural urban uh, EA directors from across the province, uh, people from within communities, worked together on the 20, run, 20 recommendations that we came up with. So my first question would be, um, they're so lockstep with the province, so you know, will the province commit to a working partnership with UBCM in order to strengthen the local government finance system to support shared local provincial priorities as outlined in UBCM's policy paper? Well, thank you, Brian, and uh, greetings, delegates. It's uh, good to be here, even in this virtual format, to take questions two by two, as Brian said. If you could see the deluge of rain outside, it is Noah-like rain, so questions two by two might make some sense. Uh, it is uh, a real privilege to be here. Uh, I know how much work has gone on this week. Uh, I've talked to my ministers as they've gone through the series of meetings that we do every year at UBCM, and every year I learn more about the diverse nature of our province, the, uh, the needs that differ from uh, community to community, region to region. But what is common, as you say, Brian, and uh, the UBCM executive has been uh, absolutely uh, direct on, is the need to address financing going forward. These are massive challenges. Uh, they are always complex. Uh, I have asked uh, Minister Osborne and Minister Robinson staff to work uh, with UBCM and municipalities and uh, local governments across the province, establish an MOU so we can create uh, the funding formula going forward to meet the challenges we all know exist, whether it's on infrastructure, whether it's on operating services, whether it's on any number of things, we need to have a new way forward. And that starts, for me, on Monday with the election of a new government in Ottawa. I have said to the uh, urban mayors or the major, major city mayors uh, conference that if we are going to address the mental health issues in communities not just big but small all across BC, we need a partnership with Ottawa. And how that comes forward in my mind is through um, changing the Canada health transfer. This is uh, a shared view by provinces uh, from coast to coast to coast. If we get a, a more appropriate share of health funding, we can diversify how we deliver services, how we assist municipalities on that front, and that will also have more resources in the provincial treasury so that we can reallocate those dollars that do come in back to municipalities to provide services for people. You all know these things don't happen overnight, but I'm confident uh, with uh, Minister Osborne and Minister Robinson both being very familiar with UBCM, very familiar with local government. They're uh, extra committed to make sure that we put in place during this mandate a framework that will assist municipalities and local government meet the challenges going forward. That's our commitment, but you need to know that there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have come through a global pandemic. Our budget uh, numbers in the first quarter look very, very good relative to what we had anticipated, and we need to carry that forward throughout the fiscal year. And when we go into budget 2022, if we have a framework, an MOU in place, we can start to plan so that you can start to plan. But it needs a federal partner. That's absolutely critical. All three of the major political uh, leaders at the federal level have made commitments to me that they will follow through on the Canada Health Transfer. Now we have to see uh, if the proof is in that pudding and, and money starts to flow. Thank you, Premier. I, I do appreciate hearing that you wish to establish an MOU with UBCM on that resiliency paper, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, one thing that UBCM has advocated for several years is, is reconciliation. Uh, your government, uh, in all of the minister's mandate letters, your direction is to, to look at reconciliation. Um, UBCM endorses that, and so do all governments across, local, uh, across British Columbia. Will the province engage local governments as an order of government uh, and partner during the implementation of UNDRIP and, and the negotiation of those agreements that relate to local government jurisdiction? 
Uh, certainly, Brian, where there is overlap of jurisdiction, uh, discussion has to take place. But we have to start from the principle of government-to-government -government negotiations between the Crown represented by the province and the federal government where it's appropriate, and uh, local Indigenous nations. Uh, they, of course, uh, Indigenous nations overlap with municipalities all across British Columbia. Uh, indigenous and non-Indigenous people require services. They, uh, they need the same uh, hope and, and, uh, and future that we all want for ourselves. And it starts uh, reconciliation for me with engagement, and I encourage all of you across the province to engage with Indigenous communities near your territory to start those dialogues. The formal discussions of how we deliver the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is being developed through the Provincial Work Plan. Uh, Minister Murray Rankin is in charge of that. Uh, he has been making great progress on the work plan, uh, but again, the pandemic has delayed and, and short-circuited the type of consultation that we would want to have face-to-face -face Indigenous, non-Indigenous uh, rural, rural uh, communities, uh, regional districts, uh, municipal governments, uh, to make sure we go forward. The fundamental responsibility here rests with the Crown, as represented by the federal and provincial governments, but we absolutely understand that we have a shared responsibility uh, to make sure that services are being provided in communities to Indigenous and non-Indigenous members alike, and that will start by having genuine reconciliation on the ground. And local government is the best place to start that discussion. Invite Indigenous leaders into your council chambers to have discussions and dialogue about where they want to go, where you can go together. That's how we make progress. Uh, legislative change is one thing. It's critically important to have the foundation going forward. But collaboration and consultation start by interpersonal relationships. And you can't legislate that. You just have to do that. So I encourage, as I have done, uh, uh, Brian, I've been to Brian's council chamber twice uh, as premier. And uh, I know Jerry Thiessen has been quick to say that that's never happened before. And, and that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen again. It means that's how you start a dialogue, by doing something you've never done before, engaging with people you've never had a relationship with before. And then when we find the common ground far exceeds those things that we disagree on, progress can be made. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to start taking questions directly to the uh, Premier. Again, the Engage tab. Uh, and that's how you submit back and make sure you go back to stream after you submit your questions and we'll try to get them up two by two as the premier said and uh, We'll work on these as we get through them uh, The first one we'll we'll deal with uh, from Kate Marsh uh, Councillor uh, North Couch municipality of North Cow Couch and premier Horgan respectfully what what will you do? Uh, be doing to ensure the peaceful uh, protesters at Ferry Creek are being mis uh, be that are being mistreated by some of the RCMP officers that have been assigned to that file. I fear that someone is going to uh, irreparably be harmed or worse. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the Ferry Creek blockade uh, is illegal. Uh, there is an injunction in place, not sought by the government, but by uh, the forest company that has rights in that area. Uh, on top of that, the Pachidat First Nation, whose territory uh, Ferry Creek resides in, have uh, said that they want uh, logging deferred in that watershed. That has happened. Uh, the Pachidat First Nation has respectfully asked not once, not twice, but five times for the protesters to leave their territory so that they can carry on land use planning decisions in their territory in the interest of their community. And despite that, uh, the protesters remain. I have a great deal of sympathy for the protection of old growth trees. Uh, that's why I commissioned uh, the review of old growth activities. Uh, that's why uh, last September the government accepted all of the recommendations, and that's why we've been working on implementing those recommendations. But the, the disruptions at Ferry Creek uh, do not uh, in any way assist us in advancing this cause. What it does is draw attention to conflict uh, rather than finding ways for consultation and collaboration. We just had a question about how do we introduce in our communities the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? How do we turn the page on colonialism in British Columbia? 
Well, I would suggest a good start for the Ferry Creek issue, which has been deferred. There is no logging in the Ferry Creek watershed by directive from the provincial government in consultation with the title holders, and that is what was in the body of the recommendations that came from the special panel review by uh, Al Gorley and Gary Merkel. The first order of business is to make sure there's dialogue with title holders. We're doing that. So respectfully, the best way to stop conflict at Ferry Creek is for the protesters to acknowledge that there is no logging activity going on there and go back to their homes so that the Indigenous peoples whose territory we're talking about can resolve how they want to go forward. And together, collectively, that's how you find solutions. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Um, Next question from Mayor Al Sebring, um, North Cowichan. Uh, Mr. Premier, thank you for all your work. A question uh, for, about housing supply. The panel on housing supply and affordability recommended, among other things, a change in the paradigm around land use decisions to reduce the impact of nimbyism. Your thoughts on this? Well, thanks, Al. That's a double-ender, two-by-two from North Cowichan. <laughs> I think you're going to hear something about the disproportionate focus on Vancouver Island, which is my home. Uh, and uh, thank you for the question, Al. These are also, again, complex issues. Uh, the reason we come to uh, public life, as I said in my prepared remarks, was we want to make um, positive change. We want to leave our communities stronger than they were when we arrived. And the housing challenges we face are not just about the hard to house or the homeless. It's about making sure that young families can afford to live in the communities that they grew up in or the communities that they want to raise their families in. Starts with supply. And that means we have to find a way to work with developers, with decision makers at the local level so that decisions around density, decisions around location uh, can be made in an open and transparent way. I don't want to interfere in that in any way. I want to work with you, Al, and other uh, local governments across British Columbia to find ways to work with the challenges that development uh, brings to com communities where they don't necessarily want to see that development take place. But development must and will continue to happen in British Columbia. We are so fortunate to live here, and it is no surprise that a whole bunch of other people from across the country, across the continent, and indeed around the world want to come to British Columbia to raise their families. I'm the son of an immigrant. Um, my father came here a long, long time ago uh, to make a, a, a fresh start for, for himself, and, uh, and I am the pre uh, result of that. And I believe that British Columbia can and should be a place of hope and opportunity, but in order to have that hope realized, you need a house, you need a place to live, you need a home. And that is a, a, a work that has to be done together. Uh, provincial government putting in place the incentives for development to take place, and local governments to know that they have the confidence to have the, the province have their back when they run into challenges with respect to uh, how, we, how we implement these programs in a way that gives comfort to existing communities. These are enormous challenges. You know them better than I do. You have uh, open co uh, council meetings. Our legislature has been uh, virtual for the past year, and even when it's not virtual. We don't have uh, public hearings where people come and express their grievances, as I know uh, all of you do. So it's a challenge. You've got a partner in uh, Minister Eby. Uh, Minister Robinson, again, uh, who has the purse strings, uh, did have the housing file. We put in place a massive amount of money to bring on more supply COVID got in the way. There's a host of challenges about mobility. Uh, we need to continue to build. We can, need to continue to build the public transit that we'll need to move people around in our urban centres, but also ensure that in our rural communities and our smaller communities up and down the coast, in the interior, and in the north, have the support they need to take on new people as they come to town. And the services that you will have to provide comes back to the first question, Brian, of making sure that there's a funding arrangement between our orders of government that makes sense for you. Thank you for the answer. Next question, and just a reminder, folks, if you want to get a question in, uh, hit the Engage uh, tab on your screen, and then uh, once you've submitted it, you can go back to stream, and then uh, you'll be able to watch us live again. Next question from Councillor Bob Meacham, City of Pitt Meadows. Uh, Mr. Premier, thanks for your inspirational leadership. Uh, what can local governments do more during the pandemic? Keep up the good work. Well, thanks for that. Um, my appeal to all of you, uh, as I, I said in my prepared remarks and as I say to each of you when I meet you uh, in person, encourage your community to get vaccinated. We have had an unprecedented 
uh, uptake in uh, the offer of free, uh, safe, effective vaccines across British Columbia. There are pockets uh, where there is hesitancy and where there are people who genuinely oppose, aggressively oppose uh, the prospect of a vaccination. I, I spoke uh, this morning with uh, Premier Kenny in Alberta. Alberta is, uh, is in a, a significant crisis at the moment, uh, looking for help from provinces across the country. Uh, we're fortunate that our, we're, our health system is uh, stable at the moment, but that could change. The vaccine is making this a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So I encourage you in your communities, in your neighborhoods, uh, with your social groups, if there are people you know that are still curious or hesitant to get vaccinated, encourage them to do so. Uh, provide them with uh, thoughtful, uh, science-based information to help them make that decision. And that's how we're going to be able to put the, uh, the pandemic behind us. We have this tool. It's extraordinary. Uh, when I talk to Dr. Henry and she shows me uh, the modeling and I see her light up at the prospect of her getting back to a normal life. And uh, of course, all of us have, have been in a place we never thought we would ever be over the past 19 months. But uh, walk a uh, walk a, a mile in Dr. Henry's flu bogs, uh, and, and then start to think about the enormous pressure on her to make sure she gives this government and, and the people of BC the guidance they need to protect themselves. She's been doing that diligently and faithfully. What we can do to support that is, is amplify that message. People have a way forward. They have a way out of this, and it's called uh, a COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about climate. One of the things that uh, we had this week, uh, Premier, was a heat dome presentation. We had mm -hmm. 300 de delegates attend, which was out outstanding. Uh, Dr. Henry Henderson and uh, Minister Dix were there, and so you know it was uh, it, it was it was good to hear what was going on. I was shocked to hear some of the the data that was out there. But the question that uh, Adrian Carr from uh, Vancouver is asking is around climate, the rapid climate change. Mm -hmm. will, you, uh, will the government stop investments in fossil fuels, uh, maybe instead facilitate more renewable energy production, including feed-in tariffs for First Nations, wind, solar farms, etc.? Well, thank you, Adrian. And I know you're well versed in these issues, uh, uh, so I won't, I won't uh, provide a lecture on the challenges of moving to a cleaner, greener economy because British Columbia, successive governments, left and right, have been doing that, starting by putting a price uh, on carbon, uh, the first jurisdiction in North America to do that. We've continued uh, previous government policies to make sure that carbon pricing is a foundational part of our climate strategy. We also, as you know, have uh, a, a pretty clean uh, sheet when it comes to hydroelectricity. 96% uh, of the energy used in British Columbia comes from clean, green sources. So our space to move on clean energy is limited. There, we can debate that. I know, Adrian, you might be already stomping on your computer right now at that statement, but we have a little room to, to move when it comes to clean, green energy. Where we can move is on transportation. Where we can move is on housing and, and infrastructure, physical infrastructure buildings, where another third of our emissions come from mass timber and I applaud all of the jurisdictions in British Columbia who are, are taking on the, the, the challenge of, of building with mass timber. We can use uh, spare wood, uh, residual wood products to create buildings like uh, Brock Common at UBC, uh, the uh, stadium, the, the uh, soccer stadium in Lankford and the, uh, the resort uh, addition in Penticton are just some of the examples that I visited recently. So building with mass timber allows us to continue to have a high value forest industry rather than the high volume that we have depended on for so long. Uh, 3.1 million hectares of BC forests burned up in 2017, 2018 and 2021. We have an enormous challenge ahead of us to make sure that the 350 million trees we planted last year and 350 million trees we planted the year before is duplicated going into the, into the future. As a carbon sink, there's nothing better. That's part and parcel of the old growth debate as well. Uh, so what I want to focus on is the practical. George Heyman has been, uh, for the past four years, the minister responsible. The Clean BC initiative, I believe, is, is groundbreaking in Canada and in North America. 
we are hopeful that uh, COVID uh, permitting, that he and I will be going to uh, COP uh, in Glasgow this fall uh, to make the presentation as a sub-national government that we all need to be in this, municipalities, uh, provincial governments, state governments in the United States. Governor Jay Inslee, a, a climate crusader, Adrian, who, that you will know, uh, is leading a group of sub-national governments to push national groups like uh, the Biden administration, the, whatever comes of the, the election on Monday, to make sure that North America, at least the most developed uh, part of our, of our world, takes the steps necessary to be leaders, not laggards, when it comes to climate action. I know you know a ton about this, and for me to talk any more will just make your, the letter to me longer, but I believe we're on the right track. I believe working together, we can lead Canada and North America on climate action, and municipalities, by uh, putting in place charters as they have done, are also demonstrating unequivocally, without any doubt, that British Columbians are on, on the same page going forward on climate action, and that will help us. The, the information, just going back to the, the impetus for the question, Brian, the heat, the heat dome, unprecedented, uh, and in British Columbia, in, in the rain forest, to have, until today, virtually no rain, to have uh, temperatures that we've never experienced, fatalities as a result, the consequences for social uh, unease as a, as a what do we do now? How do we prepare for a year that we've never experienced before? That's the challenge for governments, local and provincial, going forward. How do we prepare for the worst case scenario? Because we have experienced worst case scenarios over the past four years, whether it's been floods, fires, or heat domes. Thank you. They're gonna, we've talked this morning already about uh, the, the, the pandemic and the one big health crisis. Uh, Councillor Ramsey uh, from Prince George has a follow-up to that, and that's the, uh, why hasn't the province declared a health crisis for the opioid crisis and provided support to communities in the same way it has for the pandemic? Well, the, the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the uh, opioid crisis was uh, declared a public health emergency uh, back in 2015, 2016. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's been done, and uh, the work continues. Uh, the challenges, of course, uh, of COVID have meant that congregate living situations have changed. That's led to encampments. That's led to uh, using uh, a loan, which oftentimes leads to fatalities. Uh, when we came to, to government in 2017, uh, the Solicitor General, uh, Mike Farnworth, uh, directed law enforcement to not prosecute uh, for simple possession. Uh, that was the first step towards uh, decriminalizing and putting in place instead a health framework to address uh, addictions and mental health challenges. We created the first ministry in the country, now being uh, followed by other jurisdictions in, in Canada, and I'm hopeful that the new government on Monday will understand and acknowledge that more funding is required to build the beds uh, on the complex care side, to put in place regimes to protect and help those vulnerable populations. But the first thing we've got to do is decriminalize simple possession of opioids. And, and, and we have done that in, in theory, but in reality, it's a criminal code change. I'm encouraging all of the federal leaders to do that. We have been making progress with the outgoing government, uh, uh, Minister Sheila Malcolmson, uh, responsible now for mental health and addictions, uh, is very close to getting an exemption for British Columbia. I know uh, Mayor Stewart, uh, Kennedy Stewart, uh, here in Vancouver has been leading the charge, but this is not just a Vancouver issue. This is a British Columbia issue, and, and as important as it is to address the issue in our major urban centre, we need a solution for all British Columbians, and that's what we've been working on, and I'm hopeful uh, that the steps we take uh, following the election on Monday will get us all on the same page. I have had very positive working relationships with uh, the current federal government, and I am absolutely confident that I can build relationships with whoever the people of Canada select to lead them in the years ahead. But it has to be collaboration, and there has to be a reassessment of the Canada health transfer. I, I mean, I'm a broken record on this because for too long, the contribution to health delivery has been about 80 percent from the province and about 20 percent from the federal government. And we started as a 50-50 proposition in the 1960s. We need to get as close to 50-50 as we can. That will put pressure on the federal government to find more revenue. I get that. But we need those dollars to provide the services that you've talked about at UBCM for almost my entire time as a member of the legislature. Executive after executive have come to talk to uh, uh, government caucuses, opposition caucuses about the health, uh, the, the mental health and addictions challenges in communities right across 
BC, not just our major urban centres, but everywhere. And we need to address that, and we need to do it with dollars coming from Ottawa. Thank you. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the questions are coming from around the province. Uh, Janice Nightingale, Councillor, City of Rossland. Rossland, sorry. Uh, thank you for your leadership. I've listened to all the programs your government is implementing to improve housing. We've talked a little about, about that this morning already for all of our residents. I've not heard plans for active seniors, so I don't know if she's pointing a finger at me or not, but the boom generation. Uh, so no surprise, we can't leave these valuable people in our communities behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Janice, for the question. And, and for us, uh, we have a 31-point plan. Uh, you, you've touched upon that in your question with respect to housing. And uh, there are many seniors that are quite house rich but cash poor in our urban centres as land values uh, have started to skyrocket yet again. Uh, and that becomes a challenge. Uh, you want to stay in your community. You want to stay where you are most familiar with uh, uh, your shopping routines, your social activities. Uh, but if you get priced out of your neighbourhood because you have uh, uh, a home that is too valuable for you to live in, there's something, something particularly wrong with that. And so for us, uh, when we talk about housing, it's the full continuum. And that's how you end up with 31 points in a strategic plan. Anybody who talks about strategic planning, and I'm sure your CAOs and, and those who have come to speak to Council always say, you know, if you've got five points in your plan, that's probably too, too many. Well, we have 31 because the situation is so grave, and we're trying to um, attack the housing question on multiple fronts uh, to make sure that new families, young families, have a place to put down their roots, but also to make sure uh, that there are affordable homes for seniors as they age, hopefully, in place in their communities of choice. Uh, these are all uh, significant challenges and it involves partnerships. We need to build more supply and the way through uh, for development permits and all of these other issues uh, come through your council chambers or your uh, regional districts. And we need to make sure as a province that we're providing you with the support you need and that there are resources and lands available for not-for-profit housing, for for-market housing. We'll, we'll see what we can do to help in that front as well. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to build more. Our long-term care uh, infrastructure was taxed to the maximum as a result of COVID. We've made significant improvements through the pandemic. And I know Minister Dix has a, a host of other solutions that we're ready to deploy once we get to a place where we can start to engage with you in your communities and also, of course, uh, residents who will have points of view that we need to hear and you're going to hear. But the, the province needs to hear that as well. And to have uh, Josie and, uh, and Selena and the host of other, quite frankly, uh, members of our uh, government caucus who have local government experience really makes the, these discussions a whole lot easier. And uh, many of uh, my colleagues used to be your colleagues on boards and, and councils across the province. We need to make sure that those relationships stay strong and we focus on getting solutions for the people that elected us, whether they elected us to the council or to the legislature. Thank you. I, I know, Premier, you have to uh, leave uh, momentarily. Uh, I do appreciate your time. I am going to take one more quick question because it affects everybody here. It affects everybody out there, and it's social media. And the social media, this is coming from Keith Page, Councillor from Nelson. Uh, social media companies have hollowed out the revenue model of local journalism while also conducting broad social experiment on the public. With the ongoing attrition of journalism and decades of underinvestment in public libraries, what will be done to improve the social knowledge infrastructure of British Columbia? Brilliant, Keith. Uh, and I'm going to certainly uh, give you a call uh, in the weeks ahead to talk about these issues. Uh, I share your concern. Uh, one of the, I guess, one of the most fortunate things that happened to me is that I wasn't accepted at the journalism program at Carleton University a long, long time ago, and I ended up going on another path to find myself here. But I, I, I've seen the erosion of local information, credible, reliable, verifiable information for the public to better understand the challenges they face uh, locally, provincially, nationally and internationally. And as you say, the experiment that's going on with social media uh, is something that we all need to be aware of. It's not, uh, you know, sometimes I, 
uh, when I uh, grumble to my friends, and I have a, a whole host of non-political friends that keep me normal, when I complain about social media, they cock their head because for them, it is now their uh, preferred mechanism, whether it be through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, to get information about the world. And I remind them that, that none of it is verified, none of it is fact-checked. It is an opinion that is put out into the world and then absorbed by the multiple millions, depending on whether or not it starts to trend. Uh, that means that we have to look back. And, and, and I think if I understand, I mean, there's a lot packed into that question, Keith, and uh, I'm sure that all of us know to never read the comment section, but, uh, but we need to also know that we, our citizens need to have accurate information. And how do we do that without it appearing to be the state intervening? So it's a, we have, a, a, I think, a, a tussle right now between how does government protect uh, open access to information and how does open access to information protect the public that's in, that, that is consuming that information? Because we just don't know where it's coming from anymore. Uh, that worries me a lot. It worries my colleagues a lot. But my friends shrug and go, it's what I do. I go onto Facebook. I don't uh, read uh, the local paper anymore. And that's why we see a decline in uh, advertising in those papers. So we see a decline in uh, journalists because the paper owners can't afford to pay the journalists. And uh, now we're getting those who are hustling information for nothing. I was with, uh, I had dinner last night with a retired journalist. To, and we had a quite a detailed discussion about this, about working for free. Uh, that's not how you get the best possible information. Uh, you get the best possible information when you have multiple sources chasing down a story and verifying it, rather than one, one place on the internet making a declarative statement and that becomes gospel. Big challenge. Uh, I don't know if that was the best way to end the day, but Keith, I'm going to give you a call. We'll have a longer, call about, uh, longer conversation about this. Thanks, Premier. I'm going to call up... Uh Lorianne Rutenberg, <laughs> Councillor. I didn't know what to call. I guess you're the president. <laughs> you just became old news, Brian. Just like that. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, Lorianne to you. It's all good. <laughs> um, so, Premier Horgan, thank you very much for your thoughtful answers today. Um, a totally different way of having the Premier address our colleagues. And as you know, you know, we've got maybe, what, two dozen people here, whereas, yeah. you know, we'd normally have a packed house. So um, thank you for that. On behalf of the UBCM, I'd like to thank you for participating in this session. We sincerely appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And I know I'm looking forward to following up with you and your colleagues in the weeks and months ahead on UBCM's priorities. Thank you once again. Thank you, Laurie. And, and I'll just say I, I, I understand the over-under on whether Cisco the duck became part of this presentation was high. So for those in Fort St. James who I talked to as part of the uh, delegation this week, I hope the Cisco the duck is, is well and being cared for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Premier. Thank you. Yeah, you can go that way. That's, that's good. Thank you, uh, Premier. Appreciate it. Okay, um, before we adjourn, um, I would just want to say a, a few words. Uh, it's been a, a, an honour to be entrusted with the role of UBCM President for the past year. Uh, last year, was, uh, uh, I was asked what the biggest challenge was going to be for local government in British Columbia and in the upcoming term, and my answer then was uh, COVID-19 restart, the vaccination plans, all of those type of things. And, uh, and so uh, I now have roughly 365 